Well, hello, everybody. This is David Bianco. Thanks for coming back to the channel. And if it's your first time, welcome. So there's been a bit of controversy, I'll call it, or differings of opinion related to the latest Rhino Hi-Fi release of television's Marky Moon. Now, I've got to tell you, a television wasn't a band that I followed. I'd heard of them, uh, wasn't kind of into that music at the time, didn't really register. So uh, I'm not here to speak on behalf of uh, their capabilities and how good they were. Uh, I'm here to talk about the difference between mastering of one album versus another and the whole issue of what sounds better. Now, uh, I've gotten hold of a couple of samples of uh, digitized versions of both the OG and the Rhino Hi-Fi. And I can tell you, uh, they definitely do sound different. And uh, what I'm thinking of is categorizing them in a different way. And I would say that the OG has a more raw sound, I would call it, from the type of music that it was and is. And it has a, definitely a more biting high end and a lesser bottom end in it. And it kind of has that energy to it in a way when you listen to it. Now, when you listen to the Rhino High Fidelity cut by Kevin Gray, um, it has a little more bottom end, a little less top end, and is much more tame. And you can certainly hear and articulate certain instruments and voices a bit better in it. But does it really sound or feel like the original album? No, it doesn't. And it reminded me of the way I reacted to and felt about Thriller when the One Step came out. Now, Michael Jackson's Thriller album is known for its production work with Quincy Jones, its engineering with Bruce Swedeen, and its really high impact from a dance standpoint. And when you play that OG, there is a lot of energy in it, and it really grabs you. The one step, on the other hand, is what I would call, and I did a review on this, which I'll leave a link to, it was a more sterile sound in that you could definitely hear some of the instrumentation more clearly. You could kind of feel what Bruce Swedeen was going through as a technical uh, guy involved in, in making the record from an engineering standpoint, and you definitely could draw out some of those distinctions more easily in the one step. But at the same time, it didn't really have that raw energy that made you want to dance to it, which the OG definitely gave you. So again, here it is very similar in my mind that the Marquee Moon has a much more raw and energized feeling in the OG that gets a bit sanitized and a bit uh, microscopic a bit in this Rhino Hi-Fi version of it. And maybe that makes sense when we think about uh, this discussion about original intent or the way the artist wanted it and how it felt at the time versus now. You know, the truth is none of us have heard the master tape to know. So we don't necessarily know exactly what was laid down there. We know what was the outcome once it got mastered to CD or to LP. We know what it went through there. We know that some of those uh, compromises that are made have to do with uh, the technical side of a record and the vinyl and what happens when it's played. Uh, again, by the time this record was made, I'm sure it wasn't a technology issue of trying to keep the bass reduced because of record players not being able to handle it like it was in the early days with the Beatles. But I do think there was an attempt to accentuate the voices and the top end in the, in the initial OG and that that was done with intent. I would also say that probably Kevin ran into more bass on the actual master tape that wasn't recognized in the original. And because it was on the tape, he wanted it to have some presence in the actual outcome that we got. So we have an opportunity to pick and choose. 
when I listen to Thriller, if I want to kind of really get the energy of it and I'll say dance to it or really move with it a bit, I put the OG on. Absolutely. If I want to appreciate the technical work of Quincy Jones and Bruce Swedeen and what was done in that, then I put on the one step because I get a totally different articulation of what's there. And so they both serve a purpose in a way when you think about it. And it isn't a matter of one's bad or one's good. Uh, It's a matter of what we like to hear and what we're really connected with. And so viva la difference. We have a choice. And I think that's good. So a lot of this coming out in my mind really is just to tell about the distinctions that occur. Again, I don't fault in any way Kevin Gray for drawing out what was on the master tape. And I don't fault the original uh, folks involved in the production of that album in what they were trying to convey to it as well. These are artists. As a mastering engineer is an artist to some degree. They have some control. Now, should they take liberties and really go extreme? No, I don't think so. But should Kevin Gray, in fact, show you there's some bass in it because he's hearing it in the master tape? I think so. I mean, if all we want is carbon copies, then why even bother? Well, anyway, this is a little different kind of vinyl shootout because I haven't really taken the two records specifically. But there's so much discussion about it. And I did listen to the two and did come up with differentiations in my mind that I wanted to share it with you. As always, thanks for watching and subscribe if you can. Give me a thumbs up if you like this and comments are always welcome. We'll catch you next time on our Safe and Sound Texas audio excursion. Take care, everybody.